With that said, we're going to be looking at chapter 9, verses 13 to verse uh, 21. And again, what we're looking at is we're looking at the trumpet uh, judgments. And uh, these are very difficult verses to go through, um, but they're very powerful and very practical. And uh, I might as well say uh, in advance, more than likely at the conclusion of the chapter, when we get to verses 20 and 21, I'll be sharing some things with you, uh, perhaps uh, to try and how to make these things practical uh, as it relates to us even today. So beginning at verse 13, reading to verse 21. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. And out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire, the smoke, and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents, having heads, and with them they do harm. But the rest of mankind, who were not killed by these plagues, did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see, hear, nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries, or their sexual immorality, or their thefts. So, in chapter 9, we left off with the sounding of the fifth trumpet judgment. And as we've done so, we've been aware of the fact that demons have left the abyss, and they have begun to torment men on earth. They have stings like scorpions. They inflict unbearable pain on the unsaved. And those who have been stung by these demons will desire to die, but they cannot. And so the scripture tells us they will suffer in agony for five months. Now verse 6 tells us, in those days men will seek death and will not find it. They're going to desire to end their own lives, but they're not going to be able to do so. Their torment will be great, but suicide will not be an option. So they're going to be suffering terribly, and their physical pain is immense, and their internal peace is completely gone. They have no rest. They have no peace of mind because they continue to resist repentance. God has made it clear. They can turn from sin, but they refuse to. There's 144,000 evangelists who are calling people to repentance, but they're not listening. So they refuse to repent. And though they're refusing to repent, they still cry out. They're crying out and they need peace, but they're not going to have it. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 48, verse 22, there's no peace, saith the Lord, for the wicked. So the 144,000 evangelists are preaching, people, you need to repent. And as they preach, God is protecting them. There are going to be people who are saved during that time, and they too are going to be protected because these have what is said, the seal of God on their foreheads. Now, the Bible tells us in Psalm 34, verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps round about those who fear him and delivers them. And so now what we have in, in chapter 9 is the sixth angel sounding. And in, in verse 13, he says that. He said, the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice, notice, from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. And so we have passed the middle of the tribulation, the judgments are even greater. I mentioned to you that the seven-year period of judgment is divided into two parts. The first three and a half years are referred to as the tribulation, but the last three and a half years are called great tribulation. And the tribulation, the judgments, are increasing in intensity. 
And so as we closed last time, we closed with the sounding of the fifth trumpet. Hordes of demons have been released. They're inflicting pain. They're inflicting misery on the world. But now we have what is called the sounding of the sixth trumpet. Now, as we look at this, we need to know that at this point, judgment is coming partially in response to the prayers of the saints. Earlier, we had seen that the prayers of the saints had been offered up to God. And it was a prayer for God to avenge their blood because these saints are actually martyrs. We saw in Revelation 6, verse 10, they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? This is the prayer of the martyrs. And so God is answering their prayers. Judgment is being intensified. It's being poured out. And John is speaking of that here in verse 13 when he says, I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar. Now notice with me, he said, I heard a voice. The voice is not identified. Notice that it's a single voice. There are those who say that this voice is actually Jesus himself giving the order. And they say it's because he's close to the throne. He has taken the scroll from his father's hand. He's broken the seals. Others say it may be another angel, an angel that had been mentioned in chapter 8, verse 3. Because in Revelation 8, verse 3, it says, Another angel, having the golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. What we do know for, for sure is the voice is coming from the four horns, notice that, of the golden altar. Now, this altar is the altar of incense. It's a, it's a place where incense is burned. And incense, very often in Scripture, symbolizes prayer, rising to God. And so, normally, this altar of incense is associated with prayers for mercy. But John is showing it now as a prayer for vengeance. So, the trumpet sounds. And when that trumpet, sa trumpet sounds, what once was symbolic of mercy is now a picture of God's wrath. When you see the four horns, horns symbolize strength or power. And so it's speaking of the power and it's speaking of the wrath that God is going to pour out in response to the prayers. Now notice again in verse 14, it speaks in this way, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. We'll look at that for a moment. Release the four angels. When it says release the four angels, these have to be what are called fallen angels or demons because Scripture never refers to holy angels as being bound. Holy angels are constantly doing the will of God. They never need to be bound. So it is the evil fallen angels who are bound, and they're bound to keep them from doing evil and harm. They've been bound, but God is now allowing them to be released. So if we think things are bad in our day at this moment, just think of what happens when God no longer restrains the evil. Notice also it's there at the Euphrates. Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. The Euphrates River is located in Babylon. It's one of the four rivers that, came, that come out of the Garden of Eden. When you read your Bible in Genesis chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, it, it reads, the name of the first, speaking of river, the name of the first river is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there, so I'll be going there next week. The name of the second river is the Gion. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Ashur. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. So the Euphrates rises from sources near Mount Ararat in Turkey. It flows 1,700 miles to the Persian Gulf, making it the longest river in the Middle East. Now, what's interesting is the Euphrates River is connected with the fall. Someone wrote, it was near the Euphrates that sin began. The first lie was told. The first murder was committed. And the Tower of Babel, the mother of all false religions, was located. There are world powers that oppressed Israel that are near the Euphrates. Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia. 
So it's possible that the demons are kept there to serve as a reminder of God's judgment. Again, the Euphrates is connected with Babylon that is referred to in Revelation 17, 5 as the mother of harlots, the mother of all false religion. So it's interesting to note that these four angels are forming what is called a specific group. And some commentators believe that they are demons that control or had uh, a principality or uh, authority over four empires. Now, I'll share that with you and develop this for a moment. Paul, when he wrote to the Ephesians, the Apostle Paul revealed to us that Satan has a government and a hierarchy. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, Paul said this. He said, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We don't wrestle in normal earthly warfare. There is a spiritual war that is taking place. And he speaks concerning what are called the hierarchy or the order. Satan is called the God of this age, the God of this world. Satan holds a position as a ruler, and he has those whom he dominates and leads. And so Paul spoke concerning that spiritual organization in Ephesians 6, verse 12, when he made it clear, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. This isn't an earthly war. We're not fighting, you know, as Americans versus some other country. He said, no, it's a spiritual thing. It's against principalities. And so these demons are mighty princes, and they stir up evil. They stir up malice. They stir up wickedness. The word principalities, when Paul used it, refers to chieftains. That's what the word is. We're speaking of chieftains over uh, armies. They are what are called principal rulers. And it seems that there, there are demons that, that have been assigned regions of influence. And how do we know that? Well, in the book of Daniel, we have an interesting event. In the Old Testament book of Daniel, we read that Daniel had been fasting for three weeks, seeking God for an answer to prayer. And in all the time that he was fasting, his prayer remained unanswered. It caused him concern. He was wondering why God was silent. So he was by the river Tigris. And while there he had a vision of an amazing man, he's the only one who saw the man. There were those who were near him. They sensed something, and they actually they ran away. And, and this man, this angel, spoke to him. It says in Daniel 10, Verses 12 and 13, he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard. I've come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. He's speaking about demonic lords who oversee regions. And the angel said, God heard your, your prayer, but I've been hindered for what you would call 21 days until Michael, who is a chief prince, we all know him as an archangel, came to assist me. So there are demonic regions, principalities, where there are over, it has oversight over it by demonic influences. Anywhere here in the United States, that you go and find a college in a town, you're also going to find a place that is dominated by evil. Any place you go, any place there is a college, there is dominion. There are enemies there influencing the minds of those who live in that area. And that's, that's, that's an actual, actual reality. We don't see it sometimes, but it's there. So what we have is we have Demonic spirits that influence various regions, and these may be the demons that control the four major empires in the book of Daniel. Because when you look in the book of Daniel, there are four major empires that are spoken of. You have Babylon, Medo-Persia, you have Greece, as well as Rome. And these four demons are controlling a huge demonic army that is prepared to attack fallen men. Now, these demons are following the orders of Satan, and they believe that they are pleasing him by keeping his orders. But in fact, they're accomplishing God's purposes. Notice in verse 15, the four angels 
who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now for five months, death has been restricted, but now death returns with a vengeance. Notice also they have been prepared for this exact moment and they are released to kill one third of mankind. Now in chapter six, verse eight, in the fourth seal judgment, a quarter of the population died in a single judgment. And I pointed out that two billion people died from sword or hunger, pestilence, beasts of the earth. But after that had taken place, many more continued to die. Now another, another one-third die. That would be at least another two billion deaths. And at this point, over half of the earth's population has been wiped out. Listen, guys, none of us understand what that means. None of us understand what that means. The numbers are too high for us to understand or to envision. Billions are dying within the first four years of the tribulation. They're dying in a variety of ways. Another two billion have died. Half of the earth's population is wiped out. And notice in verse 16, as he's writing, he gives to us a number. The number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. And he goes on to say, I heard the number of them. I, I, I am giving you an actual number. I'm not just giving you an estimate or guessing. I, I heard the number, the number of the army, 200 million. Now, that's a huge number. Various commentators that I use explain that number away. W one of the commentators I use is a, a man by the name of Albert Barnes. Albert Barnes uh, wrote his commentaries in 1830. And he said this, Albert Barnes said, this would be a larger army than was ever assembled. <laughs> and it cannot be supposed that it is to be taken literally. For him, he, he can't imagine an army that large. In his day, there were not armies of that magnitude. But even today, looking at today, India has 1.4 million in theirs. The United States has 1.3 million active duty. North Korea has 1.28 million. Russia has 900,000. But because the, the number is so vast, commentators say you can't take that literally. literally. But these, these are demon forces, and the demon forces are already occupying earth. Remember, the demons have been released from the abyss. And so John is telling us the number is 200 million. Now, as he's looking at this, verse 18, uh, rather 17, he said, I saw the horses in the vision, and those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, sulfur yellow, and the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. Breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. Fiery, fiery red, dark blue. Hyacinth blue is almost black. It's that, that's that dark. And sulfur yellow are colors that are associated with hell. And so this is intended to communicate the terrible judgment of God. Red is the color of fire. Hyacinth is a picture of darkness. And sulfur, a burning flame with suffocating gas. I was mentioning to, to the first service today, that when I was 14 years old, I was in, in class, science class. And they gave to us the, the teacher, Mr. Course, Charlie Course. We used to call him Charlie Horse. Charlie Course. Mr. Mr. Course, uh, was, we were having a science experiment. So all of us received a small piece of sulfur. And he said, light the sulfur on fire and see what it does. And I was 14 years old and, and kind of stupid. And so when I lit it on fire and I saw that it had a real cool blue flame, I thought, hey, a little bit's cool. A lot would be even more cool. So I got a big piece of sulfur and I lit it on fire. And it filled the whole room with sulfur gas. And then the, then the air conditioning began to take it, and the vents, you know, taking it in and distributed it to six different classes in that building block. And so we were all, 
We had to evacuate the classrooms, all the classrooms in this one area. And I still remember standing out there, just kind of, I'm 14, kind of dumb. I'm just kind of standing there. And when Mr. Kors walks up to me and says, Rosales, you're an idiot. <laughs> and I said, I beg to differ. He said, oh, you want to argue as to whether you're an idiot? Do you want to go and speak to the counselor, Rachel Willett, about that? I said, no, I'm, I'm an idiot. You know, I didn't, I didn't want to go and speak to Mrs. Willett. She says, I didn't know Mrs. Willett, Willett yet. She was the, my counselor. And so she was a counselor over the four years I was in high school. By the time I got to be in a senior, she knew me very well. She really did. I mean, I would go to her office quite often. And we'd have conversations. And I, and I discovered... I, I really liked her, and I discovered that she liked compliments. So I would go into the room, and I was in trouble, and I'd, she'd say, David, why are you in here again? I'd say, you know, I really don't know, but let me tell you, that color that you're wearing right now, I would do that. I'd say, that color you're wearing right now, it's beautiful. You look beautiful with that. And she'd go, oh, really? So we became friends. And one day I was in senior math. I was telling John John about this. I was in senior math, and I was a troublemaker. I was a troublemaker. And I had a teacher who, he, he grew to hate me. He didn't like me. I was always disrupting the class. And one day he couldn't take it any longer. He actually, during the class, stopped the class. He said, Rosales, come with me. We're going to see Mrs. Willette. And so he swore at me and took me to, class, to see my counselor. I still remember sitting there in Mrs. Willett's office, and she, he says, this guy here is disrupting. He's always causing problems. He's a smart aleck. He doesn't do his work, and, and he's just, just reaming me as I just sat there. And then finally, Mrs. Willett looks at me, Rachel, and she says, David, is that true? I said, may I ask you a question before I respond? She said, of course. I said, is it proper for a teacher to swear at a student? And she says, no, it's not. I said, he just cussed at me. <laughs> I said, he swore at me. And she looks at him, did you swear at him? Scott free. I got no, no problem. He hated me even more. I don't know why I'm telling you that. It just comes to mind. I think it's kind of a funny story. But anyway, we ought to get back. Sulfur. Sulfur smells. It smells terribly. And so this pic these pictures, what you have here, fiery red, dark blue, sulfur yellow, like I said, are all associated with judgment, with hell. Red, again, the color of fire. Hyacinth, the picture of darkness, because Jesus speaks of hell as being outer darkness. And sulfur is a burning flame and suffocating gas. And in Revelation 14, verse 10, uh, that verse speaks of the judgment on those who worship the beast and take his mark. It says, He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, sulfur, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now he's speaking here and describing, notice verse 19, the power is in their mouth, in their tails. Their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they do harm. And there are those, Hal Lindsey and others included, who believe that this, this could very well describe modern war machines. They could well describe what he would say is mobile ballistic launchers. Whether that's true or not, that's a possibility. Whatever it is, there are, it's great attack is taking place. And these things are destroying, destroying people. Again, uh, by these three plagues, a third of mankind is killed. Once again, a third of mankind. Verse 18, by these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire, smoke, and brimstone, which came out of their mouths. Again, severe judgment. These plagues bring death to one-third of the remaining population. That's over a billion people. Again, it's hard to imagine. All you need to do is think of the United States. We have a population between 330 350 million. 
Just think of the United States being wiped out three times over. And you get an idea of what's taking place. A billion more people are dying. And in the midst of this, those who were not killed by the plagues, he says, did not repent. In spite of severe judgment, in spite of death all around, they don't repent. Even under the incredible events, people remain hard. They don't repent. They don't seek God. And the world is being literally destroyed. We, we've already seen how the seas have been filled with, with death. A third of the creatures in the ocean have died and, and have begun to rot. The smell of putrefying flesh of death is everywhere. The smell of decay is everywhere. Now, we Americans, many of us have never really been around real stench. We, we just haven't. Outside of our morning breath, we don't know what smell is. I was in India. I've gone to India twice. I've spent a month in India in ministry. And I went to India. I had a, a handheld tape recorder, and I was recording everything. We're at this place here. We're at this place here. And I began to see things and experience things I had never experienced before. When we arrived in Bombay, for example, they have double panes of glass there in the airport because the heat and humidity in the area, uh, when it, w it's just really warm and it's very hot, and there's so much trash and everything around that the stench is amazing. Some of you have been to India. I don't say that to, to in any way diminish the, the beauty of the people that, that need the Lord and all of that. But it, 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 is, uh, it is, there's a lot of, of decay. And I mean, right from the beginning, you step out of the doors of the airport and you begin to smell the stench of, of uh, just the decay. And we were in a bus and they were taking us to the Taj Mahal. And we had to get up like at four or five, I forget, it was very early, and it was a long drive. And the bus that we were in didn't have air conditioning, so we had to have all the windows down. And as we were traveling, I had this handheld recorder, and I was saying, well, we're looking at this, and we're looking at this. And I still remember as we were traveling, I saw a lake in front of me, a lake, large enough to water ski on, a lake that you would see if you went, uh, you know, anywhere and saw a small lake. It was it just a lake. And, and so I'm looking at it, and I'm saying, oh, in front of me is a lake. And I said, lake, and then I started gagging. I started going, it's on, it's on tape. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> it was sewage. It was sewage. It was a lake of sewage, a lake large enough for you to take a boat and water ski on. I'm not talking about a small pond. I'm talking about when you're looking out the bus and you see the shoreline, you thinking that it's a lake. And it wasn't a lake of water. It was a lake of human waste. And in the heat, 90 plus degrees, 100% humidity, can you imagine what a pleasant experience that was? So we don't understand that because we Americans have, many of us have not experienced that, have not been there, have not seen that, haven't, haven't smelled the waste and, and, and all that's taking place. And, and, and so for us, it's hard to understand when he's describing this, but you have to know that the population is being destroyed, that billions at this time through the judgments of God have died. Billions have died. There's the smell of rot. There's, there's famine. There are diseases. Uh, there are rats and various other vermin that are carrying uh, these plagues with them. Animals are attacked. I mean, the picture here is so severe. We Americans, we have a tough time thinking, oh, you know, that's, that's not true. But indeed, indeed it is. And, and he's speaking concerning this, and this is what is happening and he's speaking concerning mankind being killed by the fire, the smoke, the brimstone. He says in verse 19, their power is in their mouth and in their tails. Their tails are like serpents having heads. 
and with them they do harm. But notice verse 20, but the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or of their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. So in spite of the severe judgment, he's saying, they refused to repent. Even under these incredible events, meteors and, and, and fires and everything, water that's turning into blood, everything, the people remain hard. They don't repent. They don't seek God. And in verse 20, he begins by listing, uh, verse 20, 21, he lists five sins they will not turn from. Five sins. Notice, first, they will not repent of the sin of idolatry. When he speaks of the works of their hands, he's saying they construct their gods. He's speaking of them being guilty of idolatry. He said that they should not worship demons, idols of gold, silver, brass, and stone. You see, in idolatry, demons are actually being worshipped, obviously not the God of the universe. Demons are being worshipped. Again, in India, we were taken to various places, and they took us also to the temples that some would go into to worship in. And I remember walking into this one particular temple, and there were children who were in front of the, in front of the entrance. These children are begging. Now, we were told by our, our, uh, our guides Bring food to give to the children. Because if you give them money, the money you give them is actually handed to what we would call a pimp. They hand the money to their controller. They don't keep it. None of it goes to them. And they told us these children, many of them, have been sold by their parents because their parents have no money. They've been sold into this slavery. Because poverty, when we were there, we saw it was worse than anything I'd ever seen. I saw a woman breaking large rocks into gravel, and she worked sitting in the sun for 10 hours a day. And my guide, as we drove by, I said, what is she doing? He said, oh, she's making gravel. She works there at that site for 10 hours a day, and she breaks the large stone into gravel and sells the gravel, and she will make 50 cents today. Let that set on you for a second. Ten hours breaking stones into gravel. Ten hours for 50 cents. He said with that 50 cents, she will buy her children something to eat for the day. And she does that every day. And so we were seeing these kinds of things. And it overwhelmed. By, by, the, by the seventh or eighth day, I was ready to come home. I, I was broken in a way I'd never been broken, seeing all the pain, seeing all the poverty, seeing all the illness. And we had gone into a particular uh, temple, a, a Hindu temple, and these babies, and they have broken arms. And they tell us, you know how their arms uh, are broken? Yes. Well, the pimp snaps it and then lets it heal at an angle, because the pimp knows that tourists, Americans especially, have compassion on these babies and will give them sums of money. They actually break the children's arms and their feet and their legs like that. We saw that, right? And so you go into this thing, and we gave them food when we went in, and, and we go in to see what's going on, and there are rats in this particular temple that are actually the gods that the Hindu pilgrims, quote-unquote, are worshiping. They bring with them grain, and the grain they place on an altar. And you see all of these rats that are eating the food. And one of the guys told me that enough grain is fed to rats in the course of a year that if you were to take a, a train, you could have a train stretching from Los Angeles to New York, filled with grain. That's how much grain 
is fed to rats as they worship the rat god there in India. God hates idolatry. God hates it. And you find his words against it in both the Old and the New Testament. Idolatry is not worshiping God. Which is why I made a comment because a particular man closed his prayer in the opening of, of Congress, I, I believe it was, by praying in the name of Brahma, in the name of the monotheistic God, and uh, a God known by various names, which is why I made a comment and I said, we don't need clowns entertaining the goats. We need pastors feeding the sheep. And what this guy did was wrong. It was a, a vain thing for him to do. And people said, oh, he's just great, isn't he lovely? No, he's not. He needs to repent. But that's the problem, you see. That's the problem. You see, in idolatry, the demons are being worshipped, not God. In Deuteronomy 32, 16 and 17, it speaks of how they provoked him to jealousy with foreign gods. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons, not to God. To gods they didn't know. To new gods, new arrivals that your fathers did not fear. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20, Paul said it like this. He said, the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. So God forbids idolatry in the Old and New Testaments. Exodus 22 through 6. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. In the New Testament, 1 John 5, 21 John said, little children, keep yourselves from idols. You see, the thing that you worship, you become like. If somebody worships Christ, what do they refer to him as? They say, that person's Christ-like. You worship God, that person's godly. You become like what you worship. And so you are known by what you worship. In, in uh, Psalm 115, verses 4 through 9, listen. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they don't speak. Eyes they have, but they don't see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they don't smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. What you worship, you become like. What you are known for is what you're worshiping. So all of us as believers, I think it right that we would be known as godly, as Christ-like, as believers in Jesus Christ. Because what you worship, you become like. They will not repent of their idols. In the midst of all this judgment. Second, they will not repent of their murders. The word murder speaks of violence. It, it, it is something we see today. We see death and violence today as more commonplace than I think in my lifetime at least. And the Bible says in Exodus 20, verse 13, thou shalt not murder. But we have it. It's something that the taking of innocent life is something that, that people actually think is a, a platform to run for a political office on. We have that today. Oh, we're going to continue to make sure that you have the freedom to kill your unborn child. 
Now, I don't say that to those of you who have gone through abortion. I do not say that to you to make you feel bad. Forgive me if, if that hurt you. I don't intend to. Because if you're, in new, if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. God forgives and wipes away all of your sin. And God gives you his forgiveness, his mercy, and his compassion. And I, for one, will not judge you for a decision you made. I'm not trying to do that. But I am saying that we live in a society where that is something people actually think is a right to kill a child. And when somebody says, oh, we, kill about you. we care about you older people. See, I'm the old person they care about. We, we, we care about you older people, and we want you to be well. But you're killing children in the womb. Don't tell me you care about me, because if you don't care about the baby in the, room, in the womb, you will not care about the older person. You won't care. That's a lie. That's hypocrisy. And it's something today people fight for as a right. And God says, they will not repent from that. And look at our society right now. We are already primed for that. Already primed for that. Where people do not repent. In Psalm 106, verses 37 and 38, it says, They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons and shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, the land was polluted with blood. And our land is polluted with blood now. Third, they would not repent of their sorceries. The root word for sorcery is where you get the word pharmacy from, pharmakeia. Drugs were used to induce a state suitable for religious experience. When I was a hippie kid and I was into drugs and all of that, I went through this phase where when I dropped acid or I was taking particular drugs, I would try and get in touch with the other. We called it the other. Didn't know whether it was a god or whether it was a power, some energy in the universe. All I know is that when I was high, there, were more than, there was more than one time when I tried to meditate myself into a place where I would connect with the energy of the universe and, and I used drugs. And that's how it was at that time. I believe it's still that way now. There are still those who say, oh, I want to get into contact with a higher power. And they will do that through the use of pharmacia, through pharmacy, through sorcery. And so drugs during that day were used to induce a state suitable for religious experience. The word sorcery there is associated not with drug use alone, but drug use very often accompanied seances and witchcraft and even mediums. Sorcery, drug use in this way, utilizing it not as, as a pharmaceutical because I take medicines. It's not saying you shouldn't take a, a, a shot or, or, or take medications properly used. They're, they're important for us. I, I use them at least. This is speaking about the use of it to connect with something else or even in, in a, uh, a way to just uh, recreationally experience things. But Galatians 5, 19 and 20 says this. He says, Paul said, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, and sorcery. And then he goes on, they would not repent of their sexual immorality. When he speaks of sexual immorality, it's a word that actually is translated and can be speaking of every form of sexual expression. So that word can speak of pornography, pedophilia, homosexuality, adultery, cohabitation, even bestiality. And he said they would not repent of their sexual sin. We live in a world that applauds it, that celebrates it, that gives permission for it and thinks you're weird if you're not having it. To be a virgin is actually a mark of shame today. It's a mark of shame. And, oh, no, I have to experience it so that I can know what life is all about. And your friends will tell you. I've had young ladies who've spoken to me after they've yielded up their purity. And they said, but my friends were saying, my friends were saying that, that I, would, I wouldn't feel any different about myself after I did it. And, and now I do feel different about myself. I remember hearing of a young lady who was talking to some friends who were trying to encourage her to sleep with her boyfriend. And, and one of them said, 
why don't you sleep with him? And, and the young lady said in response to that, she said, uh, anytime I want, I can become just like you. But you can never become just like me. Because I want to keep my purity for the right moment, for the right man, and in marriage. But they today, and I'm not beating up on our society. I'm just speaking as an observer of it. Um, no, there are, there are shows today that uh, marrying strangers, I mean, it's just crazy. We celebrate that. And a true love story is the guy and the woman marrying, even though they've been with many others, now I found the right one. That's a true love story today. So purity is not celebrated. Purity is not something that people say you should retain, and yet it's something that God very clearly says. They did not repent of their sexual immorality. They didn't repent of their fornication. You see, sexual intercourse isn't forbidden in Scripture. Fornication and adultery are. In Hebrews 13, verse 4, it says it like this, Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. In Revelation 22, 14 and 15, when we get to the end of the book, blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the gates into the city. But outside are dogs, sorcerers, sexually immoral, murderers, idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. Outside, Fornicators, those unrepentant who continue in sexual sin are not welcome in the kingdom of God. You will not enter in if you don't repent and turn from it. And then fifth, and they would not repent of their theft. Materialism motivated by greed. A lust to gain, which reveals a lack of trust for God. The Bible says in Exodus 20 verse 15, thou shalt not steal. Ephesians 4.28 says, Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. They would not repent of their thefts. They will not repent of stealing. Okay, here's where I get in trouble. I'll say it this way. I, I, I believe there ought to be term limits for those who are political in our political uh, government. I think there should be term limits. I don't know. I, I don't, yeah, I don't know how you get rich. I don't know how you end up owning three luxury homes, making less than $200,000 a year. How's that happen? How do you end up with millions of dollars in a bank when you're making one hundred and seventy dollars to $200,000 a year? How's that happen? And I really believe that if the people who are in office right now had a limited time, they'd be more careful because they'd be living under the laws that they pass for other people. And because they don't have to do that, because they'll never pay for medical care for themselves, they'll never have to worry about income because they make a six-figure uh, income after retirement, because they'll never have to care about any of those things. They'll always have, they'll tell, they'll tell people like you and me, you know, the Second Amendment, we need to abolish that, but it's okay if I walk around with armed guards because I'm important and you're not. Well, that kind of hypocrisy has to stop. And we already have it today. And I can, I can see how people, thank you for appreciating that. I see people today who are already primed for this. You can't go and eat. But I'm going to go to a place that sells uh, each dish $350 a plate. And I'm going to be there with my friends because this guy helps me to get elected. But you know, don't you dare meet with your family on Thanksgiving. You don't love people. If you get together on Christmas, you don't love people. That kind of hypocrisy has got to stop. And what we have is a lot of Americans who are spoon-fed propaganda and are allowing it to continue because you hated one man. Well, guess what? That one man did a lot of good for us that you won't appreciate for another four years. That's a fact. That's a fact. I told you I was going to talk to you at the end of the study. You could have left. I don't understand it. I was reading that uh, our former president, Obama, 
in order to live the lifestyle that he lived as president, that he would have had to have been paid a billion dollars a year. That when he went on vacation, listen, he was from Chicago, right? Where'd he go to vacation? Hawaii. Why didn't you go to the south side? Clean it up. It could use your help. Seriously. It could use your help. You have a voice. Help. No, I'm going to Hawaii. And I'm taking my mother-in-law, and I'm taking 300 people, and we're going to stay in the best hotels in Hawaii, and you're going to pay for it, taxpayer. And we say, okay. And that's what we do. And we never question that. We never think about that. We never do. Why, why is your mother-in-law getting a pension? I think it's, it's $80,000 a year. Why is your mother-in-law getting that? Oh, because she babysat your children for those eight years, and now she was an employee that I should pay my tax dollars to. But she traveled with you. She lived in the White House. You have millions of dollars that you make from being a president. Listen, I'm telling you, we're already poised for this. We just don't see it. We're already poised for this. You just don't see it. They will not repent from their thefts. No. I think Pelosi should get out. I wish she'd gotten out yesterday. I'm serious. I mean, she's got to go. She's got to go. And Schumer and all of those people and every person, both sides of the aisle, that are in it for themselves, get out. You're not helping me. You're not helping my children. You're not helping my grandchildren. You're not helping any of us. You're helping yourself, and you need to get out. And they're not going to vote term limits. I'll tell you why. Because that keeps them from becoming millionaires. There are more millionaires in Congress. But we don't know that, do we? Why? Because we think they love us. They don't love us. When they pass laws, it's for themselves. And they're exempt from them. Oh, you can't, you can't, you can't have a weapon in your home to, to defend yourself in the event that somebody breaks in to, to do you bodily harm. But I have to have... A, a guard with me 24-7 because I'm important and you're not, please, please, please. If you don't think this stuff's going to happen, it's already, it's already there. It's already happening. We just don't see it. We're the frog in the kettle and the water's been turned up. It's slowly rising in temperature, but because we can't tell the difference between hot and cold because we're frogs, we're going to boil to death, the frog in the kettle. And we're seeing that today. So when I read this, I've seen stuff like this already. I've been in places where this stuff's already happening. Not all of it, but some of it. Plagues, idolatry, sexual sin that's accepted and normalized, thefts. Their hearts are calloused. There's no desire to repent. Because of this, God's wrath falls on them and continues to do so. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. Such were some of you, but you've been saved. You've been washed. You're not that anymore. You're not a, a fornicator. You're not in this. Why? Because Jesus Christ washed you and cleansed you and made you brand new. That's why. And that came through repentance. That's how it happens. You see, these sins could have been forgiven if they would have repented. But mankind is so addicted to them. They think they're normal. They even think they're good. And the result, they will not repent. What they will do, even we're seeing right now, what they will do is they'll censor you. They'll say, you shouldn't say those things. You're filled with hate. I'm watching to see what takes place because we're already moving into the area where preachers like me for teaching the Bible may do some time in jail because what we say is so against 
what people believe. You watch. If you can't have your um, parlor and the various other social media because what you say is hate speech, what do you think is going to happen when they get hold of my tapes and Rawls' tapes and the guys who tell the truth? What do you think is going to happen? So keep us in prayer because I'm going to hand the church to John. He'll go to jail.